Uh, before I pray and get rolling, I, I've used this illustration before, but I want to tweak it a little bit. So sometimes I feel like when I come up to, pre to, to preach, um, I feel like a fire hydrant <laughs> where I've taken the lid off and you're thirsty and the water comes blasting out and you're trying to get a drink out of fire hydrant. Sometimes I feel like a power washer. You know, power washer's just got one beam and it's blasting. And it hurts a little bit because it does a little scraping. I think I was a power washer last week, if you were here. Um, sometimes I feel like a, a brook where you just go up and you kneel down to drink if you want to, you know. Reminds me of the passage in Ezekiel where he's describing kind of a vision of God and at one point, there's the river coming out from the temple, and, and then he's ankle deep, and then he's knee deep, and then he's waist deep, and before long, he's swimming in it. So there was an option, kind of like you could have gone deeper if you wanted to. Uh, and sometimes I feel like just this glassy, purple, crystal clean pond. And it's like you can go up and drink from the side of it, you know. And then there's times when I just feel like a drip. Like you're in the desert and the dew comes in the morning and you take those big leaves that might be on your little desert island and, and, and the dew just collects up enough moisture that if you get it at the right hour in the morning, you could just maybe get one drip to trickle off that leaf and get into you. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's not about how I feel. Maybe it's about how the audience feels. And sometimes uh, the word is for the taking. Jesus says that his word and his spirit in you is like a river of living waters that will flow out of your belly. I love uh, his word. I think that those that know me know that I love it. And it's amazing. And so what I'm going to attempt to do this morning um, will be interesting. I'll... For a few of you that care to do it, if you want to let me know, what, what was that? Was that a fire hydrant? Was that a crystal clear lake? Was that a river? Was, what was that? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this group of people that have gathered here to worship you, to lift up your name, to participate in the breaking of bread, our remembrance of you, our koinonia, our fellowship the recollection that so long ago you gave your only begotten Son for our sins, for our life, so that we could be eternal beings with you. And you shed blood through him and, and his body was broken for us. Father, I thank you for your goodness and I'm excited to see the days ahead with all these youth. That is just amazing, Father. It is just a joy, and we pray that you would continue to allow us to be fruitful in that way. In Jesus' name. So, I'm going to be at a little different tone. And I'm going to roll with it and see where it goes. And you know how it is with me. Sometimes I'm like a ramp, and I get higher and higher. But I'm not sure what it'll be today, so you let me know. The title today is When in Rome. And I think most of us that have been around know the phrase, When in Rome... Do as, the Romans. do as the Romans do. Well, that's not a verse in the Bible, just so you know. I mean, like, it is one of those verses we uh, hear, or sayings that we hear a lot, but it's not in the Bible. And, and what does that mean, when in Rome, do as the Romans do? Blend in. Blend in. Mm. Okay. Or be what else? Or be killed. Or be killed. <laughs> okay. Interesting. So I, I, I uh, <laughs> match, match with the crowd. Yeah, yeah. Match your flavor, your style with the crowd. <laughs> okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I want to start with saying what I'm attempting to do today. I'm attempting to talk about the church in Rome. Uh, and I'm giving you a grand overview so we'll dive in, we'll kind of dip in and dip out, dip in and dip out. Uh, but that's, that's kind of what I'm doing. And what book do you think I'll use to do that? Romans. Okay, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And, uh, but here we are, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And I, being me, had to know, well, where did this phrase come from? And how was it applied 
when we under, and you know, thank God for the internet, we can do a lot of research. One translation says it was more come down as if you were in Rome, live in the Roman way. If you are elsewhere, live as they do there. Augustine, so we're in the fourth century now, with his mother was visiting Rome. The Roman Christians fasted every Saturday. That was not the custom elsewhere. His scrupulous mother wanted to know what they should do. So Augustine asked his mentor, the one who baptized him, Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, and his response, which is recorded for us, is, when I go to Rome, I fast on the Sabbath. When I am here in Milan, I don't fast. Thus also should you do. To what church, by chance, you come, observe its customs, if you want neither to be a scandal to someone, nor someone to give scandal to you. Well, that was interesting. That, that, that unlocked a, a lot of thought for me because basically what I found was it, it, to be in Rome and to do as the Romans do meant to be respectful, to be courteous, or to uh, be sensitive to the traditions of that local body. Mm -hmm. And I, I, yeah, I kind of like that. You know, uh, I've been to a lot of worldly events in my life, unfortunately. And when I was younger, I got my fill fast. And I remember even knowing that phrase, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And that meant if, if the Romans were drinking it down and they could all take six, then you take six too, maybe seven. Because in Rome, you do as the Romans do. It, it meant to dive in and, and to blend in. Yeah, but at any consequence... And so in this context, it's, it's not being presented as, as to do uh, sin. It's presented as to be sensitive to people's traditions. Amen. You know, Jesus, in regards to the Sabbath, because, you know, this was an interesting one, fasting on the Sabbath. And it, and, and it was interesting because um, Augustine's mom was like, do we have to fast? <laughs> <laughs> If they fast every Saturday, does that mean we have to fast every Saturday? <laughs> there was a real concern about her hunger, right? And so she wanted to make sure she had the right answer. And uh, you think about Jesus saying one time, he said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Because they always questioned Jesus a lot on Sabbath practices. And they wanted to know, you know, Jesus, are, are you going to follow our traditions? And a lot of times, Jesus bumped their traditions. So when is it when you're in Rome that you're supposed to bump the tradition? And when is it then you're in Rome and you're supposed to keep the tradition? You know, when does it become important enough that you think that, no, I'm not going to comply? If it hurts your conscience? Maybe when it hurts your conscience. When it comes down to, hey, the word, thus saith the Lord. Yeah. The, Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit's moving on you, and, and you start to feel like, man, this is, this is the direction I need to go, either to comply or not to comply. A lot of good factors there. So serve God to the best of your ability. Give no one offense. Christians today, as then, waste a lot of energy arguing over the minors and neglecting the mission. Wow. Sometimes it becomes like, I'm going to make this the, the hill of beans that I stand on to fight for. And it's a, a minor issue. And the reality is that unity is more important. And you could have sacrificed that. Yeah. You, you could have just skipped eating that Saturday. Mm -hmm. it, it really wasn't that big a deal. Yeah. Uh, and so that's an interesting uh, aspect of this, this thought. In Romans chapter 14, 5 through 9, Paul kind of is addressing the same subject. He says, one esteems one day as more important, and another one esteems every day alike. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And the one who does not observe the day, he does not observe it to the Lord. The one who eats... He eats to the Lord, 
since he gives thanks to God. And the one who does not eat, he does not eat to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, or if we die, we die to the Lord. If therefore we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. I hear the same message here about what Paul is attempting to explain to the Roman church is that you've got to be sensitive. That there are going to be some people that are going to promote one day above another day. There are some people that are going to promote food on certain days, but not other days. And so uh, I feel that sensitivity in this passage. He does it again, and this one is, I'm going to ramp it up here a little bit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse 19 through 23. And by the way, Paul wrote the letter to the Romans while he was in Corinthians. Okay, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Though I am free, he says, and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Yeah. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the Torah, I became like those under the Torah, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those who not having the Torah, I became like one not having it, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Wow, Paul, it really gets blunt here. Paul basically is saying that I adapt myself to the culture, to the moment, to the ambience, to the room around me because I want to be effective and influential for Christ. That nothing matters more than that level of influence towards Christ. I want to have the maximum impact. And if I'm going to have the maximum impact, I'm going to have to make myself a slave to all people. Wow. Well, that does not sound really appealing to the flesh. To our natural man, we hear the word slave and we're like, mm, boom. That does not sound attractive. And it's not American. No, okay. Not at all. We are very much into autonomy freedom, independence, bootstraps, I did it on my own, strong, stand for yourself, be your own man. No one is my master but me. Okay. And so for Paul to just condescend to that level and said, I have made myself. He says, though I'm free, I am free and belong to no one. No one owns me. I like it. He says, I'm free and no one owns me. But I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. What an amazing heart Paul had. And so uh, that, that is something that is interesting. And I, I was thinking about influence. And you can be influenced or you can be an influencer. And there's a time to be influenced. There's a time to be a recipient, to be a sponge, to take in the moisture that's being offered around you. And there's a time to give. There's a time to be the one that makes the difference in the place, in the room, in the conversation, in the situation, in the service. In, 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 and when I mean service, I don't mean this service. I mean the service of life. Yeah. And so what you are is... is you're either going to be a sponge that can be squeezed and it can be giving moisture to others or you're going to be soaking it in. You're going to be influenced or you're going to be an influencer. Amen. And so where you put that sponge makes a lot of difference. And so Paul's basically saying, you know, that when I'm in a certain environment, I try to acclimate for Christ, for the gospel's sake, for Jesus, I try to blend in. If the guy likes baseball, then, then I do my best to like baseball, even though I'm a football fan. 
Yeah. Okay. If the guy likes uh, burritos and I can't stand anything Mexican and, and I like Chinese food, for the moment, I like burritos. And it's not lying. It's not like he goes in and says, I like burritos. Okay. It's just that he moves past that. Yeah. that that's not the issue to fight this battle on. Yeah. I'm going to eat the burrito. Yeah. You know, I remember as, as missionary folks in our first trip, kind of official miss, missionary work between David and I, we were in the Middle East and this Russian family, 20% of all Israelis are of Russian descent. One out of every five Israelis is Russian. So if you, if you live in Israel, English, Russian, Arabic, and Hebrew are the big languages. But anyway, so we were in a Russian house, and they were so happy that we were there, and they wanted to feed us. And so, of course, the, the meal that they wanted to feed us would be the most special because they're entertaining these wonderful people that have come to serve them as missionaries. And, and they're so excited, and it was fish soup or borscht or something of that sort. And I can handle any food because my mom was one of the old schoolers. <laughs> and you eat what's offered you on your plate. And you do that long enough in life and you start liking it. It's just a sick way of humanity, you know? You just do anything enough times, maybe 40 times, and you get the taste buds for it. But apparently, Davine got sick with fish as a kid. And so when it came to fish, food poisoning, adverse PTSD, ooh, convulsions. <laughs> and you know, what do you do if you're trying to be polite and you, 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 you eat something that, that you don't really like? You, you try to get a small portion, right? Or a big napkin. <laughs> get a, get, you get a big napkin to hide it, but if you don't want to hide it, you, you get, a, get a small portion. And, and, and when you have a small portion, well, and also if you're like me, like I really didn't like peas as a kid. And so I, I swallowed them whole. Peas with milk were great, because milk and pills, you know, boom, 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 boom. Just take them down. All the peas went out whole and probably came out whole. Yeah. That's how I loosened myself up. I just say those stupid things, Amanda. So here she was. She ate the fish, but she got a small portion at first, and she gobbled it up. Well, guess what? When you gobble it up in that culture, guess what they think? Like you like it. You must. You need some more. And I think, did they give you the fish head? No. They decided to give her the prize piece. Oh. The fish head. <laughs> and I knew, I knew the whole night I was laughing under my skin. Like, I was like, <laughs> Davine is eating this fish. She is making a sacrifice for Jesus tonight. And, and, you know, as time would go by, those would become our best friends. Wow. And they would learn that, that Davine didn't like fish. <laughs> but in day one, you don't shove all your standards of friendship at somebody. Yeah. If you want to build a friendship, you've got you to gotta make some sacrifices on the front end. You know why it's so hard for us adults to make friends? Because we've got too many standards. We've got too many bars for people to hop over. Got too many rules, too many likes and don't likes. We got too many opinions. We got PTSD from too many other relationships. We apply things that happened in the past with our relationships with other people to the new people. Well, that's the way that person that hated me, they, that, that's the way they wore their hair, or that's the way they dressed, or they were tatted out like that, and they treated me like that, or oh, I saw the last person that earring in his left ear like that was gay. And you know, na 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 And we have all these stereotypes. Yeah. And so we don't give anybody clean slate. Okay. Well, kids, totally different. It is so amazing when you go to a playground with your kids and they're young and they're two to five years old. They play, 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 and eventually you see that they've made a friend and, and eventually it's time to go. And uh, you're like, come on, come on, Mariah, it's time to go. And, and she comes running over and, and who's your new friend? I don't know her name. <laughs> they don't even make a name standard. Have you noticed, some of your parents, did you notice that? Your kids would make friends without even knowing their names. What's the first thing we do? What's your name and what kind of work do you do? Oh. We go right to assessing the person. Wow. It's no wonder we have trouble making friends. Mm. Yeah. So Paul's preaching this, 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 this theory, this kind of approach 
uh, influences in life, you know. And, and yet there's a, there's a flip side to this. In Romans 12, 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Don't be conformed to this age. On the other hand, Paul's saying, you know, I don't want you to be such a chameleon that you actually become like them. Like, where's the balance? Where's the, where's the medium ground? W what point does your influencer become the influenced? At what point does what you take in produce what you put out? You know, um, this kids, this is important for kids. Peers. If anything messes with our young ones, it's peer pressure. And so if all my peers do it, I feel like I need to do it. You don't understand, Dad. That's what they're all doing. I want to blend in. We have this weird kind of thing. We want to be unique, but then we don't want to be unique. We want to fit. We want to be part of the crowd. Okay. And so Paul's saying when you allow yourself as a Christian to conform to the point that you are straying away from Christ, then, then you've gone too far. You are not being a good evangelist at this point. You are actually doing the opposite. You are the dry sponge taking the world into you, and you're becoming like them. And this is why good company can corrupt. Bad, bad company corrupts good oh, yes. Good, thanks. Good company can make you awesome. Bad company can corrupt good, good, good character. And so we got to have this balance between winning souls and conforming to the world. Yeah. Yeah. And so where are you? You know, when you go to work, are you the influencer? Or are you the influenced? Where are you when you hang out with your neighbors? Are you the influencer? Or are you influenced? Where are you when you hang out with your choice friends? Are you giving them Christ? Or are they helping you to be dark and evil and think lustfully and tell nasty jokes and laugh at things you shouldn't laugh at? Are you letting darkness win? Or are you letting the white light win? Are you there to save their souls? Or are you there to lose yours? Wow. Okay. How are you influenced? Just as a person. Is it by people? Is it by your job? How about your entertainment? I, I think about this. The movies I watch sometimes, how does, how does that become entertainment for me? How could the time that I spend watching evil be profitable mm -hmm. at all? What you take in becomes what you put out. Yeah. I've lost 43 pounds as of today, Come on. this year. Wow. Went on a weight loss thing, figured y'all didn't want a fat preacher up here, and I started being out of breath, okay? And honestly, Davine started losing weight, and it made me feel shameful. <laughs> and uh, so I, I went after it. What, 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 what's been the secret? Well, I went into the doctor, and he shaved it all off for me. No. Um, I didn't do that. I, and, you know, some people have to do that. I get it. I chose to just moderate the amount of food that I eat. People say, what special diet are you on? A keto or all meat? Are you doing the vegetarian? Are you doing this? You know, South Beach, or North Beach, West Beach, none of them. <laughs> Weight Watchers, no. Nothing. It's just been, you're only allowed so many calories in a day and if you limit that, you will lose weight. Input becomes output. Yeah. We understand that with food. Yeah. We understand it with muscles. We could talk to Alex about pumping weight and how you do that and the special training and, and exercise and, 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 and the way you exercise creates strength. We know that there is a, a effect by a proper action. Why in the world do we turn that knowledge off when it comes to spirituality? Wow. 
Why do we think that we can put in, put in, put in darkness, 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 negativity, uh, false doctrine, and all kinds of junk, and not expect that one day that will be your output? And here's Paul saying, I want you to be in the world. I myself, Paul says, am a slave to every man so that I might win them. He's in the world. You know, some Christians have taken this to the extreme. They become isolationists. They become monks. They all dress in the same suit. They ride in a horse and buggy. They, they, they do what they have to do in order to, to isolate themselves from the world, to be separated. And they haven't won a soul in 100 years. Yeah. They make babies. And half their kids stay in the faith. No. Is that what Jesus said? No. Matter of fact, Jesus is described as one who eats with sinners. They call him a drunkard and a glutton. He's mistaken as being somebody who's worldly when you know as well as I do, he's not worldly at all. Mm -hmm. The world never influenced him. He was without sin. Yeah. But he was in that world. So the message is not to keep you out of the world. When Paul says, don't be conformed yeah. by this age. Don't let it take you over. Don't think because it's the latest fad and it's the greatest this or the greatest that, that you have to do it. Yeah. You don't have to do it. Yeah. You can stand in a confidence that comes from the Holy Spirit, not a confidence that's temporal. You know, if the coolest thing on, on town is to have the Michael Jordan tennis shoes, that's cool for a while. And, but the thing about fads is, man, you just wait six months. Or Apple phones. Like, how many Apple phones do you got to make until you realize that Apple is the richest company in the world? Yeah. Because they keep it faddish for a while. They make it faster. They tweak it. The power button's better there on this one. The screen. Have you seen this one? It's that one. It's this one. That marketing technique is as old as dirt. Yeah. Make them want it now. And then six months later, make them want the next one. And ridicule the one who has the third generation. Yeah. Tease them. Let them know that this is, oh, you've got a third generation iPhone? <laughs> and a status symbol. You create this peer pressure thing. Yeah. And it's awful. And, and, and so on the one hand, Paul is saying, yeah, I want you to enslave yourself to win the world. But don't enslave yourself to the point that the world wins you. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we're talking about this Roman church. And Paul's never been there. Wow. He writes a letter to Rome and he's never been there. Mm. A matter of fact, as you do the research, nor has any apostle. Rome was not a visited place by the, the, the major 12. Paul had never visited the church in Rome when he wrote Romans. And so we have to ask the question, where did the church come from? And so we go to Romans chapter 1 here. And here's Paul and he's introducing himself. And he says, I'm Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, having been set apart for the gospel of God. You know, I want to key it again. There's Paul calling himself a slave. There are different words for servant. This is the strong one. He, he, he doesn't use the lesser words. He uses the strong one. The lesser word is... Good. Diakonos, which is deacon as we know it or otherwise translated as minister, a servant. Okay. He doesn't use that word here. He goes right in for a, a word that would mean something to the Roman mind. And he says that I'm a slave. I'm a slave for Jesus. And I've been called to be an apostle. Now this word apostle here is not a title. It's a uh, messenger. It's, uh, it, it's a designation of being one sent. It's somebody who has been given the, you know, a male woman or mailman that comes to your house with a letter by Greek definition in its bland form is an apostle. Wow. Okay. And with your careful searching of the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans, you'll find that Paul doesn't spend any time talking about deacons, apostles, prophets, 
any of these roles that we have in the church today. And most commentators would say that's because they haven't yet been established. This church is so young that it doesn't have this structure, this body of organization yet. We're going to learn that they meet in a house. They, they, they are, are uh, completely a church, I believe, that has been won by traveling typical Christians. Wow. It's a church that's been born and been impacted because of Christians just doing what Christians are supposed to do. Amen. Okay. This letter was not written in response to a letter like Corinthians. But, but even with an understanding, it was written that it would land in a broader audience. So he doesn't address specific details. In Corinthians, we've been with Richard learning that, you know, when he addresses the Corinthian church, he's, he's responding to a letter and all kinds of things. You got a man there who sleeps with his stepmother. You got those that are drunk. You got those that don't wait, wait, wait when they come to eat. You got those who don't take communion right. You got, and he just goes on and on and on in the first Corinthians letter. Not in Romans. In Romans, the, the, he's addressing a crowd he's never met. And he's thinking about what are the basic principles of faith that are the most important. What is the bean hill that I want to stand on and fight for? Amen. Do I want to fight for whether you meet on Saturday or Sunday? Absolutely not. Do I want to fight for whether you fast on this day or that day? Absolutely not. Do I want to fight for whether you wear this or you wear that? Absolutely not. And so what we're going to do is we're going to boil it down. And, and, and the, the letter to the Romans becomes this powerful, integral book that is basically, what would you give to a fledgling church if all they had was this? Wow. And, it, and it's powerful and it's blown, theolo you know, Romans ends up being the most quoted from book in the early church fathers of all the New Testament. Wow. It becomes the sacrifice ground for where Calvin stood and Luther. It becomes the book by which men say faith is what you need. You got to have faith. It's the book by which other men come up and say in Romans, it teaches you that faith has work and obedience to it. Wow. It's a powerful book. And, and, and it's still baffling people to this day. Uh, a lot of people have heard it taught that, that Peter established the Roman church. Well, in the Bible... No apostle is credited with the original foundation of the development of the Roman church in the Bible. It came, by, why, it, it, it came to be by way of general disciples that journeyed to Rome. Though eventually Paul and Peter and possibly even John would visit there. In Paul and Peter's case, they would visit there to be imprisoned and eventually killed. Wow. Okay. So what does that mean that, that no apostle established it? It means that we don't have a pope. Amen. Okay. We don't. Yeah. And we don't start a pope on a, on a city and in a, in a story that, that came out of nowhere. None of the early church fathers, I've combed them, for the first 350 years of the church would even dream of saying that Peter started the church in Rome. Wow. They do not say that. Our own writings, our own church fathers, those that we as a global universal church would claim, we can look to those early writings of Clement and Ignatius and, and Tertullian and Origen and, and any ones that you want to name in those first 350 years. You will not find them making a proclamation that the, the church in Rome was established by Peter. Yeah. It, it just didn't happen. Did Peter die there? I think he did. I think Peter met us in there. And so did Paul. So, you know, we got some hints to who might have started that church. Do you remember Priscilla and Aquila? In Acts chapter 19, there's this couple that is fleeing Rome because there's persecution of Jews there. And the Roman government says all Jews have got to get out. And so they flee and they're tent makers and they hook up with Paul. And Paul's happy to hook up with them and they became a, a relationship. And, and then Paul goes off to his next journey in, in Ephesus and different places. And while Priscilla and Aquila are there, they meet this guy named Apollos. And, and they show him the way of God more clearly. The Bible says that Apollos understood about Jesus and he taught about Jesus effectively, but he stood upon the baptism of John. He only understood the gospel up to the point of John. 
And so Aquila and Priscilla, normal disciples, not apostles, just people being Christians, meet this Apollos guy, and they sh the Bible says they show him the way of God more clearly. And he becomes this, this awesome disciple. Well, and with years uh, five, to be exact, the, the prohibition of Jews in Rome goes away. And one of the interesting things about Aquila and Priscilla is wherever you find them in the Bible, they're having a house church. Amen. They're having church in their house. Come on. So, so they're successful, okay? They've they got to be successful to set up house anywhere you want in, in the first century culture. But when they get the opportunity to go back to Rome, they go back to Rome. Yeah. They already got a house there. Yeah. And so we'll find in Romans chapter 16 and verses uh, 1, 3 through 5, I'm going to go there myself because I want to read it. Actually, looking at one, Paul says when he sends this letter out, he says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sincrea. I, 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 I highlight this one for a couple reasons. One is the letter of the Romans is being sent to the Roman church by a woman. Okay. Wow. And number two, she is a servant. Guess what the word for servant is? Diakonos. Diakonos, okay. And so a lot of people are argue and say, hey, here's an argument for women deacons. Okay. Because they get hung up on the title thing. They're really keyed into what is your title. Okay. He goes on in verse 3, he says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risk their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. He's telling the Roman church, greet my buddies, Priscilla and Aquila, who have come back to Rome. Greet also the church that meets at their house. They're meeting at their house again. Greet my friend, Apennatus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. So, so we see that this guy who we don't know anything about, who was one of the very first converts in the area of Asia, moved to Rome. And he helped establish that church there. And he says, greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. And so Paul takes the time to list women, three, in this just a short brief time, that made great sacrifices for the church. Okay. They offered their home. That's what disciples do. You know, I think about homes. And, and we have an amazing home that I'm really grateful for. But if we didn't use it for Christ... May it burn down. Yeah. Your home is not for you. You're going to be on earth maybe a hundred years. If you're not using your home for Christ, you are selfish. And there's a lot of reasons why you'd think you wouldn't want to use it. It's just not nice enough. Man, we had a 730 square foot third story apartment in Tel Aviv that was on the corner of a bus stop. Mm -hmm. Constantly noise and across the street, <laughs> constantly noise, but yet across the street was a graveyard. Wow. Nothing attractive about it. We chose it because it was cheap. Wow. And because it was near the bus stop because we had no car. And everywhere we're gonna go is gonna be on bus or foot. Yeah. In the time that we lived there for almost two and a half years, I am confident that we saw probably 200 people come and visit us and learn about the Bible and get a glimpse of the fruit of the Jesus that we serve inside those doors. Amen. I had not, there was mold growing on the walls. I used to paint it every two weeks. You know, when you think about Leviticus chapter 13 and why would God put a whole chapter about mold in the scriptures? It's because out there, the weird moisture heat structure is strange and mold will creep and grow on rocks. It's just the craziest thing. And you can scrape it and put all your stuff and paint it. And then two weeks later, you're back again. It was no place of glorious splendor for us to offer up and to be part of, uh, look at what God has done for me. Let me show off my house. And yet we used it for God's glory. Yeah. Are you using yours? For God's glory. Back to the sponge. Are you using yours to squeeze a little Christ out on people? Yeah. Or when you do invite people into your home, they don't know that you even serve Christ. 
-hmm. Are you influencing them? How are you managing your impact? You know, if Peter had brought the gospel to that city and was its first bishop, later called the first pope, then why does Paul nowhere mention him in the entire letter to the Romans? And if Peter had already brought the gospel to the city, why was the letter even wrote, written by Paul to the Romans? Why was he even giving him the basics, fundamentals of the Christian faith if they had been established by an apostle? Okay. So I'm doing a little tearing down today. God must manage your life if you want the greatest impact. You know, God's very patient. Romans 2.4 says, His patience and His kindness towards us have an intention. He wants that time that you're being given, that tolerance that He's showing, that it's supposed, the Bible according to Romans 2.4 is supposed to lead you to repentance. Yeah. It's not like God just gave you a get out of jail free card and you go do what you want to do. He's waiting for you. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to speed up. So in our next slide, what we have is a diagram of, oh, didn't make it. That's a map of, of the Mediterranean. And it kind of shows Paul, through his journeys, where he wrote the letter from. And so basically what I'm trying to highlight here is that on Paul's third missionary journey, he wrote his letter to, to Rome from Corinth. And, and the significance of that is this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 22 through 30, Paul condescends to a level to explain his testimony to the Corinthians. What that means is he doesn't normally like to do this. And he gives a quick paragraph about that, how he doesn't feel good about what he's about to do. He's going to share with him his experiences. But he feels that the people that do this kind of thing are boastful, arrogant, prideful people. And so he doesn't want to you to think that I'm a boastful, arrogant, prideful person. But I'm going to share these things that I've gone through in my life because apparently you like to listen to boastful, arrogant, prideful people and you won't listen to me. So I'm going to go ahead and condescend and match their spirit so that maybe you'll listen to me. Okay. And so that's where Paul's at, he, and he tells you that. If you read it carefully, that's what he tells you. But, but I'm going to skip right to the meat. He's talking about these false prophets that you follow and these false teachers and these false apostles. And he says, are they Hebrews? This is 2 Corinthians 11, 22, 30. So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as one beside himself crazy to even talk like this. I am more so. In labors, more abundant. In prisons, more abundant. In stripes, more measure. In deaths, often five times from the Jews I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. I have been a night a day in the deeps of the ocean. I have been in travels often perils of rivers, perils of robbers, perils from my countrymen, perils from those who are not Jews, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brothers, in labor and travail, in watchings often, in hunger, in thirst, in fastings, and in cold, and in nakedness. Besides those things that are outside, there are those which presses on me daily, anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is caused to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that concern my weakness. Here's Paul. That's third missionary journey. I, want, I, I wanted you to understand where he was at in his journey. And for some reason, in the midst of a, a testimony like that, he's concerned for the fledgling church in Rome. How do you get there? How do you go through that much in your life and you still care 
about the salvation of people you've never even met. You still have a heart for a weak church in a place you've never even visited. How do you get a heart like that? In Romans, he tells them, he says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? It is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Paul is speaking to the Romans and he's saying, How, how could anyone hear unless they, how could they have faith unless they hear and how can they hear unless somebody speaks to them? Yeah. It's, it's true today. How are they going to hear unless you speak to them? That's not my job. I'm just a Christian. I'm just in it to go to heaven. I don't have to recruit anybody. I'm not an evangelist. Paul's not talking to the evangelist. Yeah. He's talking to a fledgling church that has no evangelist. He's talking to a group of people that are brand new and he's getting his heartbeat to them and saying, you've got to preach to them. Yeah. And he uses that word apostle in its verb form, not as a title. He says, how shall they preach unless they be sent? Are you sent? If you're a real Christian, you are sent. Amen. You are sent. Amen. You've been apostelen. You've found the calling of God which is to preach the gospel to your co-workers, to your family, to your friends with an urgency. Oh, I've got two oxen to kill. I've got a wedding to go to. I've got this. I've got that. I've got all kinds of excuses. That testimony I just read about Paul, does it look like a man with excuses? Wow. He had every excuse and more that you could make mm -hmm. and yet felt inspired to write this letter. Yeah. If you're hiding your faith, it's no wonder to me that you are miserable. You know, I meet people that are Christians and they're miserable. They're down. They're downcast. They, they're, now, they're not even fun to be around. Yeah. And I think it's because you are the Dead Sea. You take, you take, you take, but you have no outlet. The Dead Sea is, is high in mineral content. It's, it's made for makeup. It's made for salt on your table. It's made for all kinds of good things because it's been poured into, poured into, poured into, poured into. But it has no river out. And when a sea has no river out, it just becomes dead because the mineral content becomes so rich that it has no life in it. Fish can't live there. If the fish is swimming down the Jordan River, hitting the waves, enjoying it, getting there, when he breaks into the Dead Sea, he's done for. Some of you Christians can get that way. Wow. You learn, you learn, you got your latest this and your latest that, and, and you're hearing, and you're, and, and you're taking it for yourself, 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 and you have no outlet. Yeah. You're the Dead Sea. Mm -hmm. Bust the wall open. Uproot yourself. Change something. Break the bounds. You are sent. You are called to share that faith that you have. You have to preach if you think that there'll be any, any impact in your life. If you're ashamed of Jesus, Jesus said this in Mark 8, 38. If you're ashamed of me and my words, I will be ashamed of you. In another place, Paul says to the Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because I know it's the power of salvation. Amen. And in another place in Romans, he says, Whoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So here's the thought. If you're the shy guy, I question your belief in the first place. 
You know, Romans is an amazing book, and I hope I've sold it well this morning. But to sell it a little bit more, in Romans, Paul quotes half of all the books of the Old Testament. In Romans 1.17, he quotes Habakkuk 2.4. In Romans 2.6, he quotes Psalm 62.12. In Romans 2.6, he also quotes Proverbs 24.12. He makes an allusion in 2.24 to Isaiah 52.5. In 2.24, he also makes an allusion to Ezekiel 36.20, which is interesting because there's very few allusions to Ezekiel in the entire Bible. In Romans 3.4, he, he makes a quote of Psalms 51.4. And then later, he, Psalm 14.1-3. And then later, he goes to Ecclesiastes, which is interesting. Hardly anybody ever quotes from Ecclesiastes. And then in Psalms 5, 9 and 143 and 10, 7 and Isaiah 59, 7 and 8 and Psalms 36, 1 and Genesis 15, 6 and Psalms 32, 1 and 2, Genesis 15, 6 and Genesis 17, 5 and Genesis 15, 5 and 15, 6 and Exodus 20, 17, Psalms 42, 17, Isaiah 53, 7, Zechariah 11, 4, Zechariah 11, 7, Genesis 21, 12, Genesis 18, 10, Genesis 18, 14, Genesis 25, 23, Malachi 1, 2 and 3, Exodus 33, 19, Exodus 9, 16, Hosea 2, 23 Hosea 1:10, Isaiah 10:22 to 23, Isaiah 28:22, Hosea again in 1:10, Isaiah 1:9, Isaiah 8:14, Isaiah 28:16, Leviticus 18:5, Deuteronomy 30:12, Deuteronomy 30:13 and 14, and Isaiah 28:16 and Joel 2:32, and Isaiah 52:7 and Nahum, whoever quoted from Nahum 1:15, Isaiah 53:1, uh, Psalm 19:4, Deuteronomy 32:21, Isaiah 65:1 and 65:2, and First Kings. 19, 10, 14, and 18, Deuteronomy 29, 4, Isaiah 29, 10 again, ah, Psalms 69, 22 through 23, Isaiah 59, 22, 21, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, and Isaiah 40, 13, and Job 41, 11, and Jeremiah 23, 18, and De Deuteronomy 32, 35, Proverbs 25, 21 through 22, Exodus 20, 13 through 17, Deuteronomy 5, 17 through 21, Leviticus 19 through 18, this is the fire hydrant, guys, Isaiah <laughs> 45, 23, Psalm 65, 9, 9, 2 Samuel 22, 50, Psalms 18, 49, Deuteronomy 32, 43, Psalms 117, 1, Isaiah 11, 10, and then finally, Isaiah 52, verse 15, and this is his last quote from... Oh. Oh, yeah. 51 direct quotes wow. of the Bible, 10 paraphrase quotes, 15 clear allusions. What in the world? What in the world is he doing? You know, I hear people, uh, one who thinks that the character of God has changed from the Old Testament to the New. I hear it. People think that the Old Testament God is angry and mean and, and violent. And the New Testament God is sweet and he loves you and he loves everybody. And puppies are in heaven, right, Pam? Right? Kind of. We do this contrast. I, I tell you, study Romans. See where he gets his grace and his truth. And you will discover that the God of the New Testament is the God of the Old Testament. And the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New. And if you thought God was angry in the Old, He can be angry in the New. And if you thought God was graceful in the New, He can be graceful in the Old. Your God hasn't changed. He's not bipolar. Sorry those that are. I'm not criticizing you. He's not though. He's not. He's the healer, right? He's not a psychopath. Okay? He's not any list of the, the ailments of the mind that we suffer. That's why we come to him. Jehovah Rapha, my healer. Yahweh, my God, who is a healer. We come to him because he's perfect. Yeah. And he's awesome. And Paul brings this to the Roman church. Why? Well, because the Roman church did have one major problem that was evident to everybody. Division. There was the Jews... And there were the Gentiles. Okay. You were a Jewish Christian, which meant you were raised in the faith. Or you're a Gentile Christian, which means you're a new convert. And they didn't know how to get along. And they fought a lot about stupid things. And Paul's trying to let them know, hey, 
this is the core of the faith. Yeah. And so he weaves this masterful letter that pricks the heart of the Jews by quoting a zillion of their scriptures, yeah. while at the same time always addressing the Gentile. Wow. And it's, it's, it's a masterpiece. The last thing I want to mention is, is assembly. Well, I'm going to speed the last one just so you have it. Assembly, so this is the second to last thing. Assembly, you, you, if you're going to have an impact in your life, you know, and, and this was kind of the same as an influence, it, who you assemble with is an effect who you are as a Christian. If your best friends are not in the church, and it's been that way for a long time, it's obvious to all those that are in the church. Yeah. Maybe it's not obvious to you. People that think they can do Christianity with other people without the body of Christ. Why do people think that? Why do they think they can do Christianity without people or without the body of Christ? Well, I'll tell you why. Because they're banking on hatred, selfishness, unforgiveness, Bitterness. These are the things that keep you from fellowshipping. They hurt me. And you won't say it, but I hate them. I do not forgive them. And I am bitter towards them. Because they hurt me. And that's why you don't fellowship with the body of Christ. Wow. It's not because you can do Christianity without the body of Christ. You can't do Christianity without the body of Christ. There's no such thing as Christianity without koinonia. There's no such thing as Christianity without fellowship with other Christians. There just isn't. Now, you could be in jail like Paul, but this letter, we're going to find out these effects that Paul had, the majority of what Paul wrote, not Romans, but the majority of what Paul wrote that affects us, a lot of it he wrote while he was in prison. In his most isolated times of life, he's still reaching out to people and having an effect. He lived assembly. He lived fellowship. He lived an understanding that the body is an integral thing that has to be woven together. And he knew that assembly was part of his impact. Paul's going to finally reach Rome, but he's not going to reach as a free man. He's going to reach there arrested. And you can find that in Acts. You can find it in different books. The one I want to choose is Philemon and Philippians. And, and, and the reason I'm choosing this is because in Philemon, when he writes from Rome in prison, he says this time, and we've gone past that one, he says, uh, Paul, a prisoner, he loses his title as slave. And he says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, the brother, Philemon, the beloved one, and co-worker of us, and Alphia, the sister, and uh, these are out of order because it's Greek, Fe fellow soldier, that's an interesting term, how come we don't make that a title? Why don't we call people sunastratiote? <laughs> what do you got in your church? I got three sunastratiote. I got those fellow soldiers. <laughs> you know, Arrogance. And to the in-house church, and to the house in your church. You, you know how they do it when you're reading this? They say one. So, to the church in your house. Okay. Wow, that's cool. Another house church. Hmm. Actually, that's just about all we find in the Bible or house churches except for one time when Paul's parked in Ephesus for a couple years and he opens up a school of Tyrannus. Not that buildings are a sin, folks, but you know what? The most of you weren't one in this building. Yeah. This is a great place for us to fellowship and to meet on Sundays and to kind of have a huddle for the football game. But the real training in football comes out there. Yeah. In your house, in their house, in the park, at the restaurant, at the workplace. And if you haven't experienced that part of Christianity, I'm like, man, get on board. This is where it's at. Don't be the Dead Sea. Yeah. Don't be the Dead Sea. So my last scripture, truly, is from Philippians. And he says in chapter 4 and verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. 
I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Paul expresses his gratitude to the church there in Philadelphia for an offering that he'd made that originally that was the offering he was taking to Jerusalem when he got arrested. And so here he is, you know, letting them know that he was really grateful for their great sacrifice. Yeah. And he's letting them know, don't feel bad about me. Yeah. Don't feel bad that I'm in chains. Later in the, uh, earlier in the chapter, he tells them, that, I don't want you to feel bad about me being in chains because me being in chains has actually worked to advance the gospel. Mm -hmm. It has emboldened the brothers. It has it, it is, it is made people uh, proclaim the gospel without fear. And later he goes on at the end, he says, a a and he goes through his greeting and says, I want so-and-so to greet you and so-and-so to greet you and so-and-so to greet you. And he says, and those in the household of Caesar greet you they salute you what does that mean Paul's winning souls in prison yeah. he's winning people to Christ with his last breath and he's content and he's thankful yeah. you know content and thankful being content or thankful comes from the character of the spirit mm -hmm. and is not situational or physically bound yeah. I'm gonna say it again because this is it this is this is where it lands being content and thankful comes from the character of the Spirit, and it's not situationally or physically bound. When you make your feeling of content or gratitude terrestrial of this earth, it becomes volatile and unstable. When you camp on your peace residing in your situation, then you will have no peace. You'll have it for a moment, and then you'll lose it. If you let the influences of what make you happy and content be the things that of this earth, then you are going to be happy for a moment and unhappy in the next moment. Paul says, I found the secret of being content and thankful. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with my circumstances here on earth. Yeah. I want that. Mm -hmm. I want to be content and thankful. Despite being shipwrecked, stoned, mocked, lied upon, hurt, yeah. cheated. I'm good. How are you good? Can't even afford to pay your bills this month. How are you good? Your car broke down. How are you good? You got sick. How are you good? Your eyesight ain't what it used to be. How are you good? Family members are going the other direction and don't even want to be with you anymore. How are you good? Your children despise you. How you good? My chickens keep dying. How you good? Because my contentment doesn't live here. Father, thank you for this patient crowd. I pray that you would help us to make the greatest impact in our life. That we would show influence and be the sponge that would actually influence others. And we would manage our time and our place and the life you've given us, that we would not be ashamed to preach and that we would assemble as we should and that we would learn to be content in every situation and to be thankful, God, because ultimately it's all your gift and it's all give to your glory. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.